Hello, I'm High Hill Knight, and welcome to my review of Star Wars The Force Awakens. I give the movie an A-. minus. If you consider yourself a Star Wars fan, just see the movie. Don't worry about what the critics score. Don't worry about what Metacritic scores. Don't worry about what your friends say. Don't worry, worry about what I say. Don't worry about other YouTubers say. If you consider yourself a fan, just go see the movie, okay? Uh, with that said, I, I, like I mentioned earlier, I give the movie an A minus. I like the movie very much. There were just a couple of things that uh, sort of irked me the wrong way, but still, overall, A minus. So to keep this uh, more condensed, I'm going to mention four things that I didn't like about the movie, four things that I liked about the movie, and then give the overall reason of why the movie gets an A minus. Okay, so starting uh, with the dark side, uh, we have Kylo Ren, who is a very interesting character, but I don't understand how he could be seduced uh, by the dark side and idolized Darth Vader when Darth Vader rejected the dark side uh, and went to the light and if he's be going to be uh, initially trained by Luke Luke would have told him, yeah, uh, Darth Vader rejected being the dark side and went back to being Anakin Skywalker and he returned to the light He was uh, the conflict within him was resolved and now he wants to be a person of the light and Luke, I mean, I would imagine he would still have connection to Yoda and Obi-Wan Kenobi, and even uh, the ghost of Anakin Skywalker. So I don't really understand why Kylo Ren idolizes Darth Vader as opposed to Anakin Skywalker. I mean, I, I can understand him being seduced, but why does he idolize Vader so much? Why does he mean that the Vader version of his grandfather is greater than the uh, light version, especially since uh, with Luke, Leia, Han, uh, the Jedi ghosts uh, all available to say, no, uh, you, you want to be on the light side overall. So that's kind of weird. It's also kind of weird that he gets bested essentially by a rookie who's only picked up a lightsaber twice in her life. Uh, granted, he was injured during that climax uh, and everything, but still someone that's a seasoned uh, lightsaber duelist uh, or, or just playing a seasoned uh, martial artist should be able to handle himself pretty well with a rookie. Sure, uh, Ray has street smarts and can street fight and definitely can handle herself in a scrap, but talking about actual sword play, that's very different. And I don't care how much the Force awakens to so someone who's been several years training to use a sword, uh, should be uh, easily besting someone who's never, uh, well, only twice in a lifetime has even held a lightsaber, much less uh, knows how to use a sword as opposed to her uh, baton or just punches and kicks and things like that. I mean, this movie could be called The Force Awakens slash The Search for Luke Skywalker because that's pretty much what everybody wants. Uh, the good guys want to find Luke Skywalker. The bad guys want to find Luke Skywalker. Everyone wants to find Luke Skywalker. And then we find see Luke Skywalker is at the very end. And he doesn't say a word, which is kind of disappointing because in the first trailer, you had that wonderful monologue where it's like, you know, the, story, the force is strong in my family. My father have it. I have it. My sister have it. You have it too. Now, granted, uh, you know, that was just the first trailer. And first trailer is, you know, it always changes up by the time the final cut comes. But still, it's all this hype of, where is Luke? They even keep it in the uh, commercials, vague about the fate of Luke and what he's done. But still, it's like, Oh, great, there is Luke, and, he, and it's wonderful. And uh, from a narrative perspective, it's fine. Story-wise, it makes sense to not to show him until the very end. But it's like you got all these other characters and callbacks and things like that. Just get him in the movie, at least say a line, especially since the credits keep the uh, him as second billing. Uh, the end credits are done in the tradition of the other past movies, so Harrison Ford gets top billing, and then Mark Hamill, and then Carrie Fisher. And it's just sort of weird that Mark Hamill still gets second billing when he does not say a single word in the final cut of the film. Narrative-wise, it's fine, but still, there's just so much, oh, I want to see this character, I want to see that character, I want to see that character, and when you finally, finally see him, it's just for a few seconds at the very end, doesn't say a word of dialogue. Next up is something that's not necessarily this film's fault, but just doesn't make sense in the overall mythos of 
uh, Star Wars is that uh, Ray thinks the Jedi are myths. Now, somehow, some way, despite uh, what happened in Episode Six, or actually Episode Four through Six, but definitely uh, in the world of mythology, I don't understand how the Jedi can become myth when Obi Wan says, like, for a thousand generations, the Jedi were peacekeepers, and that might make sense if there were only like one or two hundred, but there were several hundred Jedi throughout the galaxy during the uh, high time of the Galactic Republic. Uh, so it doesn't really make sense that uh, they would suddenly become myths. These guys that have been part of the government. I mean, they weren't just, just a sect of people. They were part of the Galactic Empire government. They led uh, armies. They did peace missions and negotiations throughout several uh, hundreds of systems. So, you know, after all that, even if the Empire outlawed teaching about the Jedi and about the Force, still just for the sheer volume of people that would have been affected for the thousand generations, that that's not just going to become a thing of myth after uh, a couple of decades. That's just not ridiculous. Especially since Rey knows about the Kessel Run and Han Solo uh, doing the Kessel Run with the Millennium Falcon. So it's like, okay, so people are still talking about the Kessel Run and the Millennium Falcon and Han Solo, but they're somehow think that the Jedi are myth. Uh, you know, like, I, I don't understand that, you know. And sure, you can't believe every story you tell, you know, this might, some stories might seem exaggerated, but still just the idea that, no, man, there, there were no Jedi. There, were, there was this uh, sort of part of the government that was helping with uh, negotiations throughout the entire galaxy. That, I mean, to me, that, that would sound like if someone say, let's say today the United States collapsed and uh, 40 years from now, uh, 60 years from now, somehow the Secret Service became a myth. Like, even if whatever government took over the United States and, uh, and tried to erase all the data about the United States past government, still the idea that, man, there were no Secret Service, man, there, there, there was no guys dedicated in protecting the President of the United States. That's what it sounds like when, when uh, the myth of Jedi are, are discussed in these movies. And now we come to the last thing, which is Rey. Now, these movies have a tradition of having strong female characters. Uh, so even though Princess Leia was a princess and she needed to be rescued, once she was out of her cell, she was grabbing blasters, she was ready to fight, she was taking charge. When she got to the rebel base, she was clearly in charge and everything like that. So, you know, the women in these movies sometimes need to be helped or saved, but they certainly aren't helpless. They are uh, leaders. They know how to fight. They know how to shoot. They know how to take care of themselves in a battle. They can. Uh, they just need help, but they, you know, they're not helpless. So Ray, she's shown that she can handle herself in a fight, and she's a scrapper. And she's been taking care of herself. But once the Force awakens, she can do practically everything under overnight. It's not even overnight. It's like <laughs> it's like the Force is just awakened. It wakes up. It's showered, it's shaved, it's dressed, it's grabbed, it's keys, it's out the door, keys in the ignition, turned on, and driving off to work. She even somehow teaches herself the Jedi mind trick, which makes no sense. How this person who thought uh, Jedi were myths and legends and not real suddenly like uh, just breaks up and says, hey, you know what? I want to do this trick. And granted, yes, the will of the Force influences and motivates and, and, and pushes and pulls, but still, that's a particular skill. You just don't wake up one day and think, hey, I can control someone's mind if I focus. That's just ridiculous. She knows how to pilot. She knows how to fix machines. She knows how to do the uh, telekinesis. She knows how to do the mind trick. She can handle herself with the lifesaver. So really, what does she need? any training for, what does she need Luke for, uh, she can pretty much do everything virtually overnight. I mean, this is how she is in practically day one. Uh, a year from now, she's going to be like, I don't know, Yoda uh, or something like that. <laughs> so it's, she's too good, too soon, way too fast, uh, even for, for this movie in the way mythology goes with uh, Star Wars. All right, so now it's time to highlight some of the uh, good points. So one good thing I like to, uh, has to start with the marketing. The marketing of this movie has been excellent. 
the way they kept things uh, interesting but vague, uh, the way that uh, they mentioned how you know someone's obviously going to be the, the the Jedi, the Force sensitive person, but you don't know if it's Rey, you don't know if it's Finn, you don't know if it's both of them, you don't know if they're uh, related to each other, you don't know if they're in a relationship, uh, you don't necessarily know what's going to happen with uh, Kylo Ren and his relationship, you don't know the relationships of uh, Luke and Leia, you know, you don't even know the relationship of uh, uh, C-3PO and R2-D2, you're just like, there's enough, uh, I mean, sure, if you're a super fan, you'll have moments where you say, oh, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm not surprised by that, or I had that feeling that was going to happen, but there's pretty much no, yeah, exactly what I thought was going to happen, unless you're one of those super diehard fans who want to be arrogant all the time. Uh, this is The marketing has been excellent for this movie, so when I was watching it, there were parts where I was like, oh, yeah, I, I can see that, or I, I was not surprised about that, or I figured that was going to happen, but no, like, yep. Just like I thought, or, you know, oh, they're doing this again, or anything like that. They uh, handled this really well to um, keep some sort of uh, surprises uh, with the marketing. So definitely great with the marketing. Uh, I got to give props to them. BB-8. Uh, in another review for uh, my Gemini Holograms review, I mentioned uh, BB-8, how in all the promo, we just seen him roll around and roll around and roll around. We haven't seen him really do anything, so like I assume he has some, maybe some arms or some legs or some, uh, uh, you know, what what's inside that ball? Does he what does he do besides just roll around and roll around? So uh, I would say that uh, the character comes off very well. He's lovable. He's fun. He's funny. Uh, he has a distinct personality, and even though he's the only droid, the only droid. Uh, I was concerned that it might be difficult to have just the one droid since it's always been, uh, in the, at least in the movies, the pairing of the droids. You had R2-D2 and C-3PO to be like the sort of side commentary slash comedic relief. But here with BB-8, much of it is on him, but not so much that it's all on him. And he's pretty much the bumblebee of this movie, but the bumblebee in a good way. It's like he's going to be the face of the marketing as far as to little kids. And, uh, you know, he just, he's cute and he's colorful and he beats the beats the beats, beats uh, like Bumblebee. But in this one, I enjoyed BB-8 much more than I enjoyed uh, Bumblebee uh, in those movies. Another good thing I liked was that uh, the Stormtroopers... Uh, they can shoot. <laughs> There's been a long-running joke about how uh, the stormtroopers uh, have these blasters, but they don't really seem to hit their targets that often or major characters that often. So in this one, no, the, the stormtroopers are very much a threat. They, if they shoot, they are probably going to hit their target. Uh, granted, of course, they are the bad guys, so they have to uh, lose in the end, but still, for the most part, uh, they are very well trained and can fight and can shoot. There's even one guy who has this weird Tonfa, electrified Tonfa for some reason. I, I don't know why he got issued the electrified Tonfa and the uh, shield. Everyone else gets a blaster. One guy got a flamethrower. I guess whenever you're raiding a village, you always got to have a flamethrower guy. But still, I'm just wondering why there's just one uh, <laughs> stormtrooper or there's a battalion of stormtroopers that are issued a shield on this Tonfa uh Electrify Tonfa thing to fight. He's great when he does it, but still it's just kind of weird. But but yeah, all these stormtroopers are definitely uh they're definitely a threat in this movie. The scene with Han and Kylo Ren, I love the use of lighting in that scene. Uh, I loved how the light slowly goes away and reveals the redness and showing that Kylo Ren has fully embraced the dark side. I like that scene very much, even though I knew what was going to happen, or at least, you know, suspected what was going to happen, it still was handled it excellently well. Uh, the only thing I didn't like about it was that it took place on this little uh, uh, catwalk that's in the middle of nowhere and it doesn't have any railings. <laughs> it's not even wide enough for two people to walk across, so I don't know why this plank is here in the middle of nowhere, but that's just for uh, visual effects slash paying homage to the old Death Star that had Lots of uh, walkways and rail and without rails, but still, it just makes no sense. That this giant catwalk in the middle of uh, practically in the middle of nowhere that's only uh, wide enough for one person to walk through. But the scene itself, as far as uh, 
Kylo Ren uh, doing what he felt he needed to do to fl fully embrace the dark side and the use of lighting and the, how quiet it was and everything. That scene worked very well for me. The reason why I give this a minus is because the movie doesn't feel like its own movie enough uh, to really have a solid A. About 70% of this movie is callbacks or inside jokes or references or uh, bringing back former characters, which uh, isn't a bad thing in itself, but still it feels like this movie is like episode four through six condensed together with little bits and pieces from one through three. They took all that information, sort of shook it up uh, like a bottle and uh, laid it on the floor and then just put the pieces together randomly and made a narrative. And the narrative is very good. It's just like so much of this movie is the other movies you know, it doesn't really feel like its own. The only thing that really uh, this movie is going to be remembered is the fate of Han Solo. Other than that, this uh, seventy percent of this movie is callbacks or the old or, or the old movies. So, for instance, you have a man and a woman or orphan, just like Luke and Leia were orphans. You got uh, Finn and uh, Ray, they're orphans. Ray was left on a desert-like planet. Uh, you know, Luke was left on a desert-like planet. Uh, you got uh, a droid sent to go find an old Jedi. Uh, you got that old Jedi who put himself in self-exile. You got uh, a little uh, um, alien who's uh, wise about the Force. I mean, yes, she isn't Force sensitive. She doesn't. Uh, she's not a Jedi, but still, she's short. She has a quirk. She's very wise. She tells people to embrace the Force and know the Force and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so you got that, like just like Yoda. You got a cantina scene. You got the uh, torture gurney that uh, Holland was strapped into. Now you got uh, some other prisoners strapped into this. You got a Death Star-like weapon, and X fighters, X wing fighters are used to fly into it and destroy it from the inside. And granted, I guess flying in and uh, blowing it up is just going to be the standard of Star Wars. But still, <laughs> it's like it's been done several times. Um, you got a big fat alien that has a gorgeous. Uh, woman, uh, this time willingly, but still the giant alien with uh, the super hot babe woman. You got the lightsaber buried in, in the snow. Uh, you know, you got all these little callbacks, some more Iris than others. You got a lot of uh, cameos from characters that uh, you didn't necessarily know were in it, which is good that they were there. But still, so much of the movie are those other movies that the only thing you really remember this for is that uh, the fate of Han Solo uh, and uh, just a general relief of, okay, good, it's not bad as a people, this is a good movie. I don't have to worry about that. Uh, so that's why it gets an A-. minus. What it does is very good. It's very fun. It's very entertaining. It's very enjoyable. The uh, action is great. The visual effects are great. The sound is great. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing the next episodes that come uh, in the future. But still, as a story itself, what it does is well, but like 70% of what it does is what has been done before. So it's my hope that with episodes 8 and on, they'll be able to do their own thing, their own movies, their own story, and really feel like this is that saga as opposed to a uh, super special fan uh, fiction of this movie. Okay, so... Like I said, those are just the main points that stand out from uh, this movie. Uh, I can go on and on and on about things that I liked and things that I didn't, but those are the main points. And overall, I give the movie an A-. minus. Star Wars The Force Awakens, I enjoyed it very much. I gave it an A-. minus. All right, thank you very much for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you liked the video, please click the like button. If you disliked the video, go ahead and click the dislike button. And if you have some thoughts or comments you want to share, go on and comment. I read it all. All right? Uh, and of course, please subscribe to my channel. I have more videos and opinions to share. I would really love to hear from you as well. Once again, I am the High Heel Knight. Thank you for watching. And remember, find inspiration everywhere.